In this video, we're going to discuss substantive procedures for auditing the payroll cycle. In previous videos, we talked about setting the level of inherent risk by identifying significant payroll-related accounts, and then we talked about setting the level of control risk, first by evaluating the design of the client's internal controls, and then testing the effectiveness of those controls. In this video, we're going to talk about detection risk, which is the risk that the auditor's procedures would fail to detect a material misstatement. Whereas the auditor has no control over inherent risk or control risk, the auditor does control the level of detection risk. By changing the nature, the timing, and the extent of the substantive procedures, the auditor can increase or decrease detection risk. In short, more substantive procedures means a better chance of detecting material misstatements and thus a lower level of detection risk. So if the auditor wants to reduce detection risk to keep audit risk at an acceptable level, they need to do more substantive procedures. Now, the purpose of substantive procedures is to substantiate financial accounts and the related disclosures. And we have two different categories of substantive procedures. We have analytical procedures, which focus on determining the plausibility of relationships between different accounts. And then we have tests of details. And tests of details can be further broken down into tests of transactions and tests of account balances. Let's start with analytical procedures. If the auditor is concerned that payroll expense has been under or overstated, the auditor could estimate payroll expense based on the client's headcount. Let's say the client had 1,700 employees and the auditor estimated that based on that, they should have had payroll expense of around $30 million. If the client actually reported payroll expense of $67 million, clearly we've got a red flag. The client has reported more than double the amount of payroll expense that was estimated by the auditor. So it's possible that the client has overstated its payroll expense. The auditor could also compare payroll expense for the most recent month or quarter to payroll expense for the same month or quarter from the year before, after making adjustments for any changes in pay rates or employee headcount. The auditor could also compare payroll expense as a percentage of sales and then compare that figure with the figure from prior periods and or the industry average. The auditor could also compare actual payroll expense with the amounts that had been budgeted to see if there are any significant differences. For example, if the client had budgeted payroll expense of $20 million and then actual payroll was $50 million, the client could dig into that and try and understand why there's such a discrepancy. Now, when it comes to under or overstatement of sales commission expense, the auditor could go and identify the formula used for calculating sales commissions and then see if the amount of sales commission expense that was actually recognized was reasonable. For example, if the company had $100 million in sales and the formula for calculating the sales commission said uh, there'd be a 25% commission for every sale, then we'd expect to have $25 million in sales commission expense. But if it turns out that sales commission expense is actually, let's say, $8 million, then the, the auditor might say, hey, what the heck? We had $100 million in sales. There's supposed to be sales commission expense of 25%. So we're expecting it to be $25 million, and you only reported $8 million of expense. So why is that the case? Now, in terms of under or overstatement of payroll-related liabilities, the auditor could go and compare any payroll-related liabilities, for example, salaries payable or payroll tax liabilities and so forth, compare those to balances from the, the year before after making any adjustments for pay rate or employee headcount and see if there are just significant discrepancies uh, from this period to the period before. So for example, if payroll tax reliabilities, let's say that this period uh, we're at 17 million and then the prior period was 40 million. Then we say, wow, that's a, that's a pretty significant difference. Let's dig into this more and try and understand why there's a discrepancy. Next, let's discuss tests of details for payroll transactions. In this column, I have assertions that management is making about payroll transactions. And in this column, I have various tests of details the auditor can perform. Let's start with occurrence. Management is asserting that it paid actual employees for actual time worked. How can the auditor test that? Well, they could examine a sample of payments from the payroll journal to see if those payments were made to actual employees who did actual work. When it comes to completeness, the main concern is about disclosure particularly related to executive compensation and share-based compensation. Thus, the auditor could go and look at the details of employment contracts with executives or minutes from board meetings and then see if the disclosures that have been made by the client are sufficient. To see whether payments have been properly authorized, the auditor could examine a sample of payments from the payroll journal to see whether they're supported by approved timesheets. 
In particular, they want to see that those timesheets have a signature from the supervisor saying that this person actually did work. When it comes to accuracy, the auditor could go and recalculate the gross pay and net pay for a sample of paychecks to see whether it's accurate. When it comes to cutoff, the auditor could trace a sample of timesheets forward all the way to the journal entry that's recorded for the general ledger and verify that payroll expense was recorded in the appropriate period. When it comes to classification, the auditor could go and look at a sample of payments from the payroll journal and see that they were properly coded. For example, if it was a sales commission, then it should be coded to sales commission expense. It shouldn't be some kind of manufacturing cost or something that would affect the inventory account. Finally, the auditor could perform tests of details for assertions management is making about account balances. For example, let's say management is asserting that a specific payroll liability happens to be $50 million. The auditor could test the existence assertion by vouching that liability back to the supporting documents to see if it's an actual liability. The auditor could also go to the supporting documents to test the rights and obligations assertion to see if it's a liability of this company and not, for example, one of the employees. The auditor could test the completeness assertion by performing a search for unrecorded liabilities. When it comes to the valuation assertion, the auditor can compare amounts for payroll related liabilities, such as that $50 million, to amounts from the supporting documents. For example, they could go and look at the payroll tax returns and then compare those amounts to the payroll liabilities. In terms of classification assertion, the auditor could go and review the chart of accounts to verify that any payroll reliabilities have been properly classified. And after all the substantive procedures have been performed, the auditor is going to calculate the aggregate misstatement, and then they're going to compare the aggregate misstatement to the tolerable misstatement. And if the aggregate misstatement is higher than the tolerable misstatement, then the auditor is going to conclude that the payroll related liabilities and accounts have not been fairly presented, and they're going to require that the client make a journal entry.